But that no one misses the grace of God. How can we miss the grace of God? We miss the grace of God when we turn the Christian faith into rules and laws and expectations and behaviors. When all is said and done, the writer says, our faith is about grace. God sent Christ into the world to show his grace. Jesus died on the cross to show his grace. The entire Old Testament is a story of grace. God's grace is what Christian faith is all about. It's about God graciously reaching down to us, forgiving our sins, and transforming us into new people. There's an island in the West Indies called Hog Island, or it was once called Hog Island. It was a beautiful island with white sandy beaches, but they had trouble uh, attracting tourists. Well, one person on the island got the clever idea to change the name. And then soon they had tourists all over the place. What was the island's new name? Paradise Island. It reminds us the power of words. We need to remind ourselves regularly the words that God's grace is what Christian faith is all about. By grace, God took Peter, who cursed and denied Christ, and turned him into the greatest preacher in the New Testament. By grace, God took Paul, who threw Christians into prison, and turned him into the greatest theologian in the New Testament. By grace, God took David, the conniver, the womanizer, the bloodthirsty man, and turned him into the greatest king in the history of Israel. And God took Rahab, we find her story in Joshua chapter 2. If you want to follow along on the Bibles that are under our seats, it's on page 214. Maybe you're not sure you believe in Jesus Christ. You wonder if because of things you've done, if he can ever accept you. Rahab demonstrates that God is more than willing to accept you. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The time had come for the Hebrew people to enter the promised land, the land promised by God to Abraham. Many of the cities in Canaanite had walls around them. Most of them were heavily armed with soldiers the Israelites had to cross the Jordan River to get into Canaan. Jericho, a formidable city, was their first challenge. In order to get into Canaan, you had to go through Jericho. And he, like any good leader, Joshua sent spies ahead to check out the opposition. To call the people of Jericho barbaric is like calling the North Pole nippy. These people turned temple worship into sexual orgies. They buried babies alive. The people had been marked by destruction for over 500 years. When God promised the land to Abraham, he said, In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites. Amorites is the same as Canaanites. Has not yet reached its full measure. The time had now come. Into Jericho, the two spies crept it was in this city that the spies met Rahab, the prostitute. Why did the spies go to a prostitute's house? Well, it may have been they figured no one would be suspicious of what they were doing if they went there. there lots of people coming and going from her house. They would go unnoticed. Maybe they also figured that a prostitute would know what's going on in the city. It was also that she lived on the city wall and up at the top, so from there they could get a good view of the troops and their movements. There's no indication that they went there for any immoral purpose. I think the main reason they went to Rahab is because God led them. Much could be said about Rahab without mentioning her profession, yet in five of the eight appearances of her name in the Bible, she's presented as a prostitute. Five. Wouldn't one suffice? Why not gloss over her profession? But the Bible doesn't. Just the opposite. It points a neon light on it. 
It's even attached to her name in the book of Hebrews. The writer talks about Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and then Rahab, the prostitute. No asterisk, no apology. Her history of prostitution is part of her testimony. Her story begins like this. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. The Hebrew king could see the Hebrews camped on the east side of the Jordan River. All the people of Jericho were living in fear. When the king heard that the spies had come to Abraham's, uh, or to uh, Rahab's house, uh, he sent soldiers to fetch them. I'm seeing half a dozen men crowd down a cobblestone path into the red light district. All uh, the taverns are, are open. It's late at night. Uh, they have the torch, torches lit. The captain pounds on the door. There's a shuffling inside. Rahab answers. Her makeup is layered. Her eyes are shadowed. Her low-cut robe reveals the fringe of a lacy secret Victoria couldn't keep. Her voice is husky from one cigarette too many. She positions herself with one hand on one hip and a dirty martini in the other. Sorry, boys, we're booked for the night. We aren't here for that, the captain snaps. We're here for the Hebrews. Hebrews? She cocks her head. I thought you were here for fun. She winks an eyelid, heavy with mascara at a young soldier. He blushes, but the captain stays, stays focused. We came here for the spies. Where are they? She steps out onto the porch. She looks to the right, looks to the left, and she lowers her voice to a whisper. You just missed them. They went out just before the city gates closed. If you get a move on, you can catch them. The soldiers turn in pursuit. After the soldiers disappear, Rahab hurries up the brothel stairs <clears throat> to where she had the spies hidden. She says the coast is clear. Then she tells them all the city has been talking about you and your armies. The king can't sleep. The people can't eat. They're popping Xanax like Tic Tacs. Her words had to stun the spies. They never expected to find cowardice in Jericho. And even more, they never expected to find faith in a brothel. But they did. Look at the words Rahab said to them. I know that the Lord <clears throat> has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. This is a remarkable statement. Jericho, the mighty fortress with its double walls, has stood impregnable for years. Furthermore, the Jordan River is a barricade that, that keeps them protected from enemies. We have heard, she goes on, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. She and all the people of Jericho had heard how God opened the Red Sea so the Israelites could walk through on dry ground when they were being chased by the Egyptian army. Then when the Egyptian army pursued, God had the, the Red Sea go back together and they all drowned. She goes on, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. In Numbers 21, we read that uh, when Moses led the, the Israelites uh, into Canaan, uh, he asked the, the king of Sihon to give them safe passage. The king refused. He went out to battle against them with his armies, and he was uh, killed in all his armies. Then the country uh, the, the, next to them, uh, Og, or, or Bashan it was called, Og was the king of it, uh, he went out to battle against them too. He too was killed and all his armies destroyed. These two countries were claimed as the first two uh, tribes of Israel, the first lands that they had claimed in Canaan. 
She, uh, Rahab goes on. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. This was her confession. That she believed the God of Israel was the God over all the earth. God's grace was at work in her life. The Hebrew spies, as it turns out, were actually missionaries. They thought they were on a reconnaissance trip. They weren't. God didn't need a scouting report. He knew what he was going to do with Jericho. He was going to have the walls collapse like a stack of dominoes. He didn't send the, send the men to collect data. He sent the spies to reach Rahab. Rahab cut a deal with the spies. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. She asked them to swear by the Lord an oath that no Israelite would dare break. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there <clears throat> three days until they return, and then go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Isn't this a great story of grace? God takes a prostitute living in a nation sold out to evil and brings her to faith in him and into his family. It serves as an illustration that God's grace is what Christian faith is all about. How do we see God's grace? I see three examples of God's grace in this story. One way God's grace draws us to himself is through supernatural evidences. How did Rahab get her faith? She hears of the miracles God performed in parting the Red Sea and destroying the kings of Sahan and Og. When God led the people of Israel out of Egypt, we read that the, the Egyptians were so impressed with all the miracles that many of them went with them. We read many other people went up with them. Many people come to faith through supernatural uh, powers of God. Uh, this is one of the main ways Muslims today come to Christ. By seeing miracles. In Acts we read that many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And the Lord added to their number they, daily those who were being saved. In John chapter 11 we read that a, a man named Lazarus died. He was a friend of Jesus. Jesus did not come to see him until he had been dead four days. Then he goes up to the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. People were so amazed. It was so unbelievable that we read, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary, Mary was Lazarus' sister, and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Paul Eshelman, in his book, I Just Saw Jesus, uh, tells about a uh, Campus Crusade movie team that went into Burma. And uh, to show the movie, I Just Saw Jesus, which is the life of Christ, and uh, they boarded a public bus, and the bus uh, uh, drove over a cliff and went over, you know, side, rolled over. And uh, everybody <clears throat> in the bus was hospitalized except the three movie team members. And all their equipment was kept safe too. 
And then the, one of the team members was giving an invitation after the showing of the movie, and uh, a cobra came out and came across the stage and was, it was on, you know, on his feet. And everybody watched and kind of breathlessly, what's going to happen? And he prayed in front of them that God would show his power by taking away the snake. And, and just as he did that, the snake took off. And because of that, many of the Burmese people gave their lives to Christ. Some people come to Christ when they see God's supernatural power. One of the most potent factors in drawing people to Christ is the supernatural evidence of the presence of God in the lives of believers. Rahab is impressed by the faith and purity of the spies. They may have been the first men that have ever come to her not looking to fulfill their own evil desires. What evidences of the supernatural are found in your life? Can people see evidence of God's grace when they see you? Why don't you look at this video, it's uh, Sam Miller, one of the members of our church. He's on our board, and uh, when our, uh, daughter, our daughter Cam uh, plays on the uh, University of Montana tennis team, and when she got into middle school, she couldn't play me any longer. She got too good. And uh, so, you know, looking around for uh, ad other adults to play, and so she started playing with Amy Miller, one of our members here. Amy's a, uh, an excellent tennis player, played for uh, Texas A&M as a, a college student. And uh, after, after they played one day, uh, Cam invited her to church. So Amy came to church, and she, her husband Sam tagged along. And uh, he gave his uh, life to Christ. L listen to his story. Hi, I'm Sam Miller. I'm a member of Portland Community Church. I'm on the Board of Trustees. I'm also fortunate enough to be involved in our two programs, our two outreach programs to our church. One is at McKay Elementary School and the other is Edgewood Retirement Center. I was born in a church, in a Christian home. My mother attended church regularly. My father, not so much. But we were in church most of our lives as children. Um, my mother insisted on it, actually. Sunday school, which I managed to escape going to many times because my mother didn't go to Sunday school with us. So she assumed that we were there. When my friend Stacy Dotson and I oftentimes weren't there. We were out fishing. And I had a relationship with God when I was a child. But it was a very bitter relationship because my parents told us that any time that we did something wrong, God would judge and condemn us. But that was my relationship with God. And when I became older, after high school, I went to military and I went and served my country in Southeast Asia. And I had made deals with God, seeing a lot of things that maybe I didn't need to see and regret honestly seeing. And I decided that there wasn't a God because the kind of things that we saw happening to people on both sides of that conflict uh, had no God in them and it broke my heart. So after the military, I made a deal with God that I would no longer have him be a part of my life and I would no longer go to him when I needed something. And so for many years in my life, there was no God. There was no speak of God. There was no thought of God. I went on with my life. I got married. Um, my wife, Amy, and I have been married 18 years now and there was no God in our home Amy was a Christian woman but she didn't force God on me and I didn't go to church I didn't speak of the Bible I didn't speak of God and then about 14 years ago we started having a lot of problems in our marriage a lot of them we separated for a while and I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to lose my wife I love her so much even still and so when she and I were separated from each other, someone had told me that I should go to Sunset Presbyterian Church because there was this guy there, Ron Kincaid, who was really a significant part of their lives. And I went for many weeks, and I sat in the very back row of the church, and I got there just as it started, and I left just as it ended for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then one Sunday, Ron did his benediction walking down the aisle of the church and walked all the way to the back of the church and I'm, I don't think it was because of me 
but at the time I felt like he was trapping me because he came up to me and he said, so what's your story? And I just started crying because I felt so lost. And I felt so much comfort in hearing the words coming from him about God's love for me, about how God loved me and how much I meant to him. And so he did that for a few weeks, always ending his benediction at the back of the church. And I made a decision that I wanted God back in my life, that I had done such a great job managing it that it was falling apart at the seams. And so I said to him, I want to be a part of this. And he smiled. And a couple of weeks later, he said, hey, I want you to come up on stage with me. I wasn't prepared for that, but I did because at that point I would have done anything he asked because he had helped me be better than I was. So I did and I told a little short version of what had happened to me and my mother-in-law was at the back of the church at the time, I didn't know that she was there. And she came up to me after that was all said and done and she gave me a hug because they'd been very angry at what had happened between my wife and I. And she gave me a hug and I felt for the first time in a long time that I was part of something again. The last years of my life, I look at the life that I used to have where I was strong and independent, I was successful in my life, and miserable. Nothing mattered to me at all. And I look at the life I have today where everything matters, where my heart is so open to loving other people. It's so, I'm so, I am blessed beyond my worth. And when someone asks me how I do, how I'm doing, what am I doing? I would quote them. I, I saw an interview some time back with June Carter Cash, and she was talking to a friend of hers. And her friend said, Junie, what are you doing right now? And she said, oh, I'm just trying to matter. And so because of my relationship with God, I spend my life trying to matter to others. I try never to put me first. Sometimes that happens because human beings do that. But when that happens, I'm reminded by the many, many people who have blessed my life that God is in charge of all of this and that all I can do best is serve him and serve those who need him and be that Bible that someone may never get to read. So Sam's a great example of God working in somebody's life, his supernatural power and making a difference in this world. Another example I find of grace in this story is God's grace does not just extend to you, but also to your friends and family. I like the writer of our, our journal this week uh, uh, emphasized that uh, it wasn't just Rahab that was saved, but it was her whole family. Rahab says, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. She's talking to the spies. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Rahab's family was saved because of her faith. I this is so comforting to me as I pray for my kids. I believe that God will save Many of your friends and family members because of your faith and your prayers. A Christian parent's primary duty is to lead their child to Christ. Parenting is discipling of your children. Many parents, uh, Christian parents, draw too great a distinction between parenting and discipleship. The conventional thinking seems to be parents raise the kids and the church makes disciples. Mom and dad bring up their little ones and then the church leads them to follow in Christ. Seldom works that way. The church helps, but parents are the primarily di primary disciplers. I mean, come on. Parents are with their kids 168 hours a week. Church leaders are only with them for maybe a couple hours. Parents, it makes little sense for us to be out trying to reach our coworkers and, and, and friends for Christ and then overlook our children. Rahab believed in God 
and brought her whole family to faith. Three, God's grace can transform all kinds of people. This has to be the greatest point of this story. Rahab is a prostitute. She's a street woman. A thing in the arms of any man willing to pay. Then she learns about God and puts her trust in him. She rejects the false god of the Canaanites, all the people living in Jericho. She asks God to be merciful to her and her family. Does her sin disqualify her from being accepted by God? Does God respond, no, you filthy woman. I'm going to destroy you along with all these other God-forsaken people. No, God spares Rahab and her entire family. And she goes on to live with the Israelites the rest of her life. With one act of faith, she becomes a member of God's family. But there's more. She marries among the Israelites, and in Matthew, New Testament, 1 verse 5 informs us that Rahab is part of Jesus' ancestral line. God does not have his son born of a sinless human line. Everyone in the genealogy needs Christ, God's grace. Bathsheba, David's lover, is also part of Jesus' ancestral line. But there's still more. Rahab is cited two times in the New Testament for her faith. The writers to the Hebrews says, by faith... The prostitute Rahab, again, prostitute Rahab, it's always the way it is. Because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Rahab is listed in the hall of faith, we call it, with all these other Old Testament saints. James lists Rahab as an example of faith. He writes, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? I mean, Rahab has faith with teeth in it. She's willing to risk her life to hide the spies. And she hangs a scarlet cord from her window to show her faith. Some people ask, is it fitting that a prostitute should become an ancestor of Jesus Christ? I think it's more than fitting I mean, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us stand in need of God's forgiveness. Is Rahab any worse than us? We all stand in need of forgiveness from a holy God. Each of us deserves the judgment of God. If it was not for Christ's death on the cross, we would all be lost. Maybe your past is a checkered one. Maybe your pedigree is one of violence, rebellion, sexual immorality, addiction, stealing, lying. If so, then Rahab is your model. Teenager? Single person? Married? Empty nester? You can put your past behind by coming to Christ. Scripture says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Turn to Christ today or return to him today. Anytime you feel embarrassed about something you've done, I'm embarrassed by things I do every day of the week. Confess your sin and ask God to forgive you. For God's grace is what Christian faith is all about. Roy Regal was, uh, was a football player for uh, Cal Berkeley, uh, played in the 1929 uh, Rose Bowl against Georgia Tech. First half, Regal's picked up a, a fumble and ran it 65 yards for a touchdown. It was a huge play, but in the wrong way. He ran to the wrong end zone. As a result of that, they came into halftime with Georgia Tech leading. Coach gave his halftime speech, and at the end, Regals was in tears, and he says, Coach, I can't go back out there. I can't face the fans. And the coach said to him, Roy, it's only halftime. 
At the end of the game, the Georgia Tech players are saying, we've never seen anything like Regal's, his drive, his passion, his strength. By God's grace, it's only halftime. You have more time to live for Christ. Like Rahab, you can leave your past behind and have a whole new beginning. That's grace. Because God's grace is what Christian faith is all about. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for coming to die for our sins, to graciously offer us life if we turn to you. Father, we thank you that you are gracious with us. I know I blow it many times every week, things I say or do. And you've given me so many chances, second, third, multiple chances. I want to give you a chance to talk to God right now, just silently, where you're seated. Would you thank God for his grace to you, how he's been good to you and forgiven you and given you chances to try again? If you've never committed your life to Christ, this would be a great time. You just say, Jesus, I, <clears throat> I need your grace. I want you to come into my life, and I want to follow you the rest of my days. You pray right now. God, we thank you for being gracious with us. And because you're gracious with us, we realize you that same grace is available for every person in this world. You love every human being. And because you've been gracious with us, we ask you to help us be gracious with other people, not be judgmental. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.